Hello there, and welcome to Southwest Idaho, uh, Owyhee County. You're in the southwestern part of the state, just a beautiful area of rolling hills, um, greenery, even though it's June, it's been a really wet spring and summer thus far. So the, the wildflowers are out. It's, it's quite green for the desert. Even saw some mushrooms growing out here. Um, and great geology, among other things. Thanks for joining me today. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. And today's a little bit different from what I normally do with these videos. Uh, I'm actually out here working. Uh, I've been hired as a consultant uh, to a mining company that is looking to expand some of their operations here. And the company has given me permission to uh, shoot this little video. I'm not gonna reveal the exact location, um, just otherwise to tell you it's in southwestern Idaho, but I specifically wanted to showcase the interesting material that they mined from this site, talk a little bit about what it's used for, and then also provide some more geologic information and context here. So this area here of rolling hills, this is all Miocene aged rocks and materials. So these rocks are all from a time period from about, oh, maybe 17 million years ago, up until about 12 or so million years ago. More specifically, uh, the area in front of us here and down in the gully, this material is part of the Sucker Creek Formation. The Sucker Creek Formation is about 14 to 16 million years old, and it consists of um, tufts, ash from volcanic eruptions and tufts, some conglomerates, some sandstone, a little bit of shale, and this was mostly laid down in a stream or lake setting, and we'll we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, we'll just swing around over here, looking now towards the the west uh, at some of this material. With all the rain we've had, some of this, uh, some of the the clay rich portions of this material have become quite muddy and mucky uh, with all the water content. But let's take a look here in outcrop at some of this material. And then I'll take you up to uh, the, the current pit, the mine pit, where they're extracting the material uh, and where the workings are going on. And we'll, we'll take a look at it there as well. There's some interesting things to see there. Uh, and so you can see the, the geology here. We can see there's some layering in the rocks, um, pretty horizontally layered, or maybe just slightly dipping away from our view to the, to the southeast. Um, so these rocks don't have a dramatic tilt to them. We can see even in some of these bluffs out here in the distance that the bedding or the layering uh, is horizontal or, or nearly horizontal, gently, what we'd call gently dipping. Um, let's take a look at this stuff that I'm walking on here. Come down this little steep face. And you can see the layering a little better in this section. Um, if we look at any given piece of this material. It's very light colored, it's brittle, it's pretty easy to break with your with your hands. This is all volcanic ash, what we'd call a tuff. But there's something interesting about this tuff. Something interesting has happened to it. Uh, tuff in and of itself isn't typically thought of as a, a mineable uh, commodity, something you'd actually extract uh, with any sort of valuable resource tied to it. Uh, but here, the tufts have actually undergone some changes. These tufts have uh, undergone some chemical changes whereby a lot of the ash uh, and material in the tuff has been altered to a type of material called a zeolite, Z-E-O-L-I-T-E. And zeolites are actually commercially uh, quite um, desirable. They're used from all, in all things from kitty litter, um, to um, all sorts of industrial uses, and they're an absorbent. So they're, they're used sometimes in water softeners because they're a, a cation exchange. And so what we have here in these tufts is we have ash. So the material fell out of the sky as ash. So rather than a pyroclastic flow, most of these tufts seem to be what we call um, asphalt tough. So it's ash falling out of the ground versus a pyroclastic flow moving along the surface. Um, but these tufts have been interacting with water, either lake water or possibly groundwater, 
probably alkaline water, and that's changed the chemistry, which I personally can't uh, explain well enough and don't have the full details on, but it's changed these so that the tufts contain these zeolite minerals. And the main mineral that these contain that's of some, uh, that's desirable is a specific zeolite called clinoptilolite. And clinoptilolite is the main commodity that the company here, PDZ, is mining, and they're using it uh, mainly for, so they'll take, quarry this stuff, crush it, and then they'll use this material, once it's crushed into a, more or less a powder, to line uh, livestock pens and uh, places where there's livestock because it's an absorbent, so it, it absorbs a lot of the ammonia and the urine smell, um, and so it helps keep things kind of fresh when you have uh, large animals like that around. So that's, they sell this material um, to their customers, but it's mined right here in southwestern Idaho. Um, so we can see it's layered. It's very fine-grained. Uh, I want to show you one more thing before we go over to the pit. And in places, the texture that we see in, the, in these tufts can be a little bit different. Um, you can see a lot of brown chunks in here, specks. There's even a big black piece of material sitting up in here. Um, and so think about this as we head up into the quarry, uh, what these might be. And think about the depositional environment that we had at the time. Um, so 14, 15, 16, 17 million years ago, this part of Idaho was very close to where the Yellowstone hotspot resided. The Yellowstone hotspot at that time was in this part of Idaho. Now we're not sitting in the exact location where the hotspot was, but this would be very proximal to it. And so you would have these big explosive violent eruptions of ash that would rain down on this landscape. And in this part of the Miocene, there was, it was a very wet time in the Western United States. There were a lot of lakes, um, lots of streams and freshwater bodies. And so you can imagine then a scene where you have a very wet climate, lots of lakes and streams, ash erupting from these volcanoes. And when we're talking about ash, we're talking about feet, tens of feet, meters of ash that's erupting and settling in these lakes. And that's the depositional setting for this part of the Sucker Creek Formation. Um, lakes, streams, and these big explosive ash deposits. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and take you over here. You can see some of the piles of rock, the waste rock up here. Um, we'll take you up into the pit and show you this rock a little bit more up close and personal and talk a little bit about what we're doing here today. So here we are at the active mining site uh, for PDZ. This is where they're quarrying out the zeolite rich tuff, uh, trucking it out to another location, crushing it, drying it, and then packaging that up and selling it off to market. Uh, I'm here actually with another geologist. He's um, out on a little hike, getting some GPS points as part of our work here. So in addition to talking about the geology here, it might be fun to talk about um, like what consulting geology looks like and, and what geologists sometimes do um, in the real world. My main profession, of course, is as a geology professor, um, but in the summers, or sometimes in, during the school year, as a licensed professional geologist, I'm sometimes contacted by companies or individuals who um, require some expertise or some professional services that I can provide. So in this case, uh, the company is looking to possibly at some point uh, expand their pit. And so they've dug down quite a ways into the zeolite, um, but at some point, because they have a 
uh, claim on BLM land, they're going to have to reclaim this. They're going to have to fill in this pit, um, recontour it, seed it with native vegetation, and as best they can, um, return this location back to uh, its a pristine setting or as pristine as possible, a native natural setting. And so my colleague Jeff and I have been asked to come out here and look at places where they might expand the pit. Now, to the casual observer, it might be like, well, you just keep digging down or keep going that way. Um, but we're actually here, we want to make sure that we're looking at areas that have the zeolite rich material. Um, as we've looked around at this tuff, not all the tufts in the Sucker Creek Formation have the clinoptilolite zeolite material that is uh, the mineable commodity. And so we as geologists are looking at things like how the rocks are oriented, so how they're dipping, how that fits in with the topography. So as we look over here to the north, you can see that the, the slope of the hillside drains down towards Sucker Creek uh, to the east. Um, you can see the layers here somewhat mimic that, although they're nearly horizontal here. So we will take accurate measurements of the orientation of the rock strata in a lot of different locations. We want to estimate how much overburden is sitting on top of the zeolite rich tuff, because if the company has to remove two, three, six feet of overburden, um, that comes at a cost. They've got to dump that somewhere. So they'd like to remove as little material as possible in order to get to uh, the zeolite rich material. So we're looking at things like where they might expand, where they could put their overburden over time. Um, also looking at things like where they might put in some monitoring wells. There's groundwater beneath this area, and but we don't know how deep it is. We don't know what the chemistry of that water is. And so we're going to recommend that they put in a couple of monitoring wells, get an idea for how deep the water table is, uh, run some analysis on that groundwater to see how deep or see what the chemistry of, of the groundwater is, uh, just as background information. So, and then we'll put this all together in a report or uh, some sort of written and visual materials that we then give to them. So just a little brief synopsis of exactly some of the things we do, at least in this specific project. Um, okay, so let's look at some of this zeolite material up close. I think the first thing to think about, and we're by no means looking at the full thickness, um, but remember this was ash. Everything you're seeing was primarily ash when it was first deposited on the landscape. And from the bottom here to the top is probably about 15 to 20 feet, maybe five, six meters or so. Um, and we're not even seeing the bottom of this. This this tuff is actually, I think, tens of feet thick in the area. Um, and again, this, not all of them are, are zeolite rich. We can see some some bedding in here, so perhaps that's one discrete uh, eruption unit we're looking at there, and then a subsequent one sitting on top of it. Again, I'm just kind of doing this by the seat of my pants. The other interesting thing about these rocks as we look at them, especially as we're looking here to the north, uh, as we can see that there's well-defined nearly vertical or what we call sub-vertical fractures that run through the rock kind of in a north-south, maybe that's more of a north-west-southeast uh, manner. Let me get up a little closer so we're out of the sun. And a lot of these fractured faces are coated in, they're stained red, they're coated with some iron oxide. So groundwater has permeated these at some point and splashed this iron oxide coating right along the, the faces of, of the tuff here. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, again, probably not super helpful for what the PDZ is doing in terms of coring them, but we would want to, as we provide this material and this report to them, our job as geologists would be to, to quantify 
and to qualitatively describe the rock and the resource here as best we can and as comprehensively as we can. So we would certainly note fractures, uh, mineralization along fractures, orientation of those fractures, the thickness of the beds, anything we think is useful or somewhat descriptive uh, about the material. Um, so one of the neat things about this unit, and we looked at it at the first part of the video, we looked at that strange sort of textural, um, it was kind of like little chunks that you saw at the outcrop uh, over in the gully there just to the east of us. I want to show you what those look like when they're sort of freshly quarried um, because I think they reveal some neat insights into what exactly was going on here when this material was deposited. And you can start to see some of it really uh, just below my feet. You can see some sections where there's some black sticking out. Uh, let me see if I can find a really good spot in here. This might be pretty good here. Okay, let's get down here. So here you can see um, one of these pieces, actually a couple here I'll just kind of prop up. And hopefully you can see these little thin uh, fragments in here. You probably guessed it by now, but these are all plant fragments. So these are twigs, little bits of wood, maybe uh, rushes or grasses or other bits of organic material, vegetation, um, that's all included in parts of the tuff. And in places, some of those are this kind of pinkish color here. But in other places, the organic material has been completely carbonized and forms these black, um, almost charcoal looking uh, material in here. And you can, here's, here's even a piece that's weathered out, that's uh, broken up and kind of breaking along the, the fibers there. Um, so it's pretty incredible. So what this tells us just, and we don't see this continuously throughout the tuff, but there's definitely horizons or beds where we see a lot of this material. Really, um, and in places, I don't understand this at all, I'll have to do some sleuthing, but some of the black uh, material that looks like it's carbonized, it almost has like a little fibrous, almost like an asbestos kind of look to it. Um, but the whole point is that the presence of all this plant material and vegetation tells us just in how incredibly lush and productive um, this environment was in which these ashes fell. So these ashes were falling into maybe a marsh or a wetland or some sort of lake that had a lot of biologic productivity. Um, and of course those plants all died as the ash uh, rained down into the water. A lot of them probably maybe fell off of the trees. Maybe they were um, burned during the, the ash fall event, depending on the heat involved, that sort of thing. Um, but you can see them in places in here and they're just really quite remarkable. I haven't actually found any like awesome, what I would call like well-defined leaf uh, impressions or patterns. Um, but everything in here is just bits of plants and plant material. Pretty remarkable. So um, anyway, so this is the big pit here and the layer with all the fossils in it is pretty much right here at the base of this part of the pit. You can see some pieces of it kind of popping through there. So anyway, uh, hopefully that was kind of helpful. Just wanted to share some information about um, this area, about this specific mine site, some of the uh, things we do as geologists when we're uh, contracted to help out with some project and also give you some insights into these amazing zeolite bearing tufts of the um, Sucker Creek formation and kind of how they're used. You can probably get on the internet and look up a lot more information about some of the uses of the zeolites because they're just used in so many, so many things in our world today. But I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for spending some time with me here. Uh, and thanks to PDZ for allowing me to film a little bit of their mine operation site and share some of the geology here of the, the Sucker Creek zeolite rich tufts here in southwestern Idaho, part of Owyhee County. Thanks so much.